so maybe you can help me solve this mystery. In 1898, Morgan Robertson published his novel, Futility, or The Wreck of the Titan. It's the story of a British ship called the Titan that crashes into an iceberg and sinks into the North Atlantic Ocean. It's a work of total fiction, but somehow, 14 years later, a real-life ship with the famous and similar name, the Titanic, would also hit an iceberg and sink into the North Atlantic Ocean in almost exactly the same way. The similarities are uncanny. Both ships were described as the biggest, most luxurious passenger ships of their time. Both were practically the same size. Both could carry up to 3,000 people, which had never been seen before. Robertson writes that the Titan was built like a first-class hotel with two brass bands and two orchestras entertaining hundreds of wealthy guests on board. The real-life Titanic also carried some of the wealthiest people in the world in hundreds of beautiful cabins in first-class accommodation designed to be the pinnacle of comfort and luxury. Both ships were described as practically unsinkable. Robertson wrote that his Titan ship had 92 doors of 19 watertight compartments that could be closed in half a minute by turning a lever. These doors would also close automatically in the presence of water. Even with nine compartments flooded, the ship would still float, and so no known accident of the sea could possibly fill this many. The steamship Titan was considered practically unsinkable. The real-life Titanic also had watertight compartments and remotely activated watertight doors, an array of safety features that led Philip A.S. Franklin of the International Merchant Marine Company to say that the Titanic was unsinkable. Both ships carried only the minimum number of lifeboats allowed by law, which proved tragic when it became clear that there weren't enough to save the roughly 2,000 passengers on board. Both disasters happened at the same time of year, in the same month of April, in the same part of the Atlantic Ocean, and even the speeds at which the ships hit the icebergs were nearly identical. Robertson's description of the crash in his novel is especially chilling. Ice, yelled the lookout, ice ahead iceberg, right under the bows. 75,000 tons of dead weight, rushing through the fog at a rate of 50 feet a second, had hurled itself at an iceberg. Nearly 3,000 human voices raised in agonized screams and callings from within the enclosed walls. And on April of 1912, the real-life Titanic would sink into the ocean less than three hours after it hit the ice. Of the 2,240 people on board, only 705 people survived, mainly women and children, making it the deadliest sinking of a single ship up to that date. Both the story of the Titan and the real-life Titanic are seen as cautionary tales about the dangers of human arrogance, a warning about what can happen when we overestimate our technology in the face of the overwhelming power of nature. It would have been simple enough just to carry enough lifeboats for every person on board, but they were blinded by their own hubris overconfidence in a ship they believed was unsinkable. It's also an astonishing example of a story that's completely fictional, but somehow came true. So how do we explain this mystery? How is it that a fictional story came to mirror almost exactly the real-life events of the Titanic sinking 14 years after it was published? The most common explanation from skeptics is to dismiss all this as something called apophenia. Apophenia is the psychological tendency to try to find meaning and draw connections between seemingly random and unrelated events. The author Michael Shearer wrote that humans are pattern-seeking, storytelling animals. We look for and find patterns in our world, and then we weave stories around those patterns to bring them to life and give them meaning. In other words, skeptics say that similarities between Robertson's Titan and the real-life Titanic are really nothing more than the mind looking for patterns. And if we think we're seeing similarities between them, it's just a coincidence. But is that really a convincing answer? Because dismissing every extraordinary event as just a coincidence isn't really an explanation at all, and it runs the risk of rejecting real connections that actually exist in the world. Take, for example, the geologist Alfred Wegener, who noticed that the continents of the world seem to fit together like puzzle pieces on a map. We looked at the story in this video, but briefly, in 1929, he put forward the idea that all the continents as we see them now were once joined in a single landmass millions of years ago. 
This is called continental drift. And it seems obvious to us now, but at the time, mainstream geologists dismissed it as just a coincidence, a figment of the mind trying to find patterns that aren't really there. Of course, we now know that Wegener was right, and the patterns he saw were very real. But when he first presented his theory, the scientific establishment lashed out against him in surprisingly unethical ways. They attacked him personally. They mocked his evidence and maligned his character, calling his ideas Germanic pseudoscience. For decades afterwards, older geologists warned newcomers that any hint of an interest in continental drift would doom their careers, effectively blocking their students from exploring an alternative theory that turned out to be true. If these scientists were really searching for the truth, why did they feel the need to resort to such dishonest and unscientific tactics? It would take more than 30 years for scientific opinion to change as older geologists retired and younger ones began to find evidence for Wegener's theory. What was once considered pseudoscience now became mainstream and was accepted as obvious. The history of science is filled with examples like this, from Louis Pasteur's germ theory to Ignaz Semmelweis's pioneering studies on handwashing. Students of history have long understood that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as self-evident. And what it shows us is that the same kind of arrogance that led the builders of the Titanic to assume that their ship was unsinkable can lead scientists to be so close-minded in their worldview that they try to destroy someone's reputation to hide the truth. It's the complete opposite of the way science is supposed to work. And it's an example of what philosophers call scientism, which is an exaggerated and rigid belief that institutional science is the only valid source of knowledge. And I'm not criticizing science here. It's important to understand that science and scientism aren't the same thing. Science is a method, a set of tools to investigate nature. But scientism is an ideology, a narrow-minded belief system dressed up in scientific language to imply that only people in white lab coats and institutional approval can be the arbiters of truth. For them, it means listening uncritically to everything the experts say. And in cases like Alfred Wegener's, it can act to hide, silence, and block the real truth from coming out. The author and philosopher M.A. Rose wrote that the problem with this kind of thinking is that it demonstrates a dogmatic refusal to be curious. Skeptics write off a significant portion of the human experience as imagination, but as Albert Einstein reminds us, imagination is more important than knowledge. Why? Because defining reality by our current knowledge freezes us where we are, while imagination opens us up to what we've yet to learn. For example, cosmologists tell us that 72% of the universe is dark energy, which they didn't even know was there until 1998. Before that, anyone suggesting that the expansion of the universe was accelerating would probably have been laughed out of the room. It was contrary to all scientific common sense and just too fantastic to believe. Remembering this, it's not unreasonable to assume that even now, the universe may be real in ways we don't think possible. And so if, like me, you're not convinced when skeptics try to dismiss it all as just a coincidence, then that leaves us with an unanswered mystery. How do we really explain the similarities between the fictional Titan and the real-life Titanic? Before we go down this rabbit hole, there's two concepts we need to wrap our minds around. The first is what Swiss psychologist Carl Jung called synchronicity. Synchronicities are meaningful coincidences that happen when an inner state of the mind lines up with an event in the outside world. They're not connected by cause and effect. They're connected by meaning. In this case, the inner state of mind is Robertson's vision of his story, his description of the Titan and all of its details. The outer event is the real-life sinking of the Titanic, which happened almost exactly the same way Robertson described it 14 years earlier. These two events aren't connected by cause and effect. What connects them is what they mean. Both serve as warnings about the importance of understanding the limits of human technology. Jung says that what defines synchronicity is the sense of the numinous. It's an encounter with the divine that lifts us outside of ourselves filling us with astonishment and awe, an unmistakable sense that we're all connected in ways we can't see, in ways that hint at a deeper underlying pattern of meaning, a single unified reality from which everything derives. It's what Jung called Unis Mundus, which is Latin for one world. The second concept is fractals, which we looked at in this video. But briefly, 
Fractals are a mathematical pattern that repeats itself over and over again in such a way that each small part of the pattern looks like the overall whole. And because of this, fractal patterns are said to be self-similar. Here's an example on screen. No matter how far we zoom in or out of any part of the image, we see the same repeating pattern over and over again, infinitely. The Polish mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot used computer models to generate fractal patterns like this one, derived from what he called the Mandelbrot set. So why should this matter? It matters because, as it turns out, fractals are one of the deepest and most fundamental patterns in nature. Take the branches of a tree. The tree has an overall Y shape to it, but each branch has smaller branches of its own, where each one itself looks like a smaller version of the tree. If we zoom in even further, these branches have even smaller branches, and so on and so forth. That is a fractal, and we see them everywhere, all around us, in seashells, in the spirals of galaxies, and even inside our bodies. Our circulatory system has branching fractal patterns. So does our nervous system. Each part is a self-similar piece of the overall whole. And so in a very real sense, we are all living and breathing fractals. It's also led many thinkers to ask, could the structure of the universe itself be a fractal? And if it is, could it hold clues to unlocking the secrets of synchronicity? The psychologist Dr. Terry Marks Tarlow suggests that fractals are essential to understanding synchronicity. Because if the universe is fractal, and we are all self-similar parts of that overall whole, then wouldn't we expect to have meaningful coincidences where our inner states line up with the outside world? In other words, synchronicity happens when the fractals of our inner reality merge with the fractals of our external reality, bringing our inner world and outer world together in a way that blurs any clear separation between them. She points out that we may have an intuitive understanding of fractals because that's precisely how intuition works. At its core, intuition is the ability to understand something instantly without having to consciously think about it, to take a single slice of experience and see that it's part of an overall pattern of a much larger whole. Even history is fractal. The closer you look, the more complicated, yet always repeating patterns. What's especially haunting about the story of the Titanic is that it too seems to be a case of history repeating itself. On June 18th, 2023, a submersible vessel called the Titan carried some very wealthy people into the North Atlantic. They came to visit the wreckage of the Titanic on the bottom of the ocean floor, but they never made it. Almost two hours into the dive, communication with the vessel was lost and the Titan imploded, killing all five people on board. In a very eerie way, the Titan submersible vessel mirrors many of the details of the original Titanic. Both disasters could have been avoided if each captain had listened to the warnings they received beforehand. In 1912, the captain of the Titanic, Edward Smith, ignored telegrams from other ships earlier in the day, which warned about icebergs in the ocean. But instead of slowing down, he ordered that the ship go full steam ahead, causing the tragic crash in the late hours of the night. And in 2023, Stockton Rush, the CEO of the company that built the Titan vessel, also ignored the many warnings from industry experts that his vessel was unsafe. It was steered remotely with a video game controller. It was built with carbon fiber instead of titanium. And while the two events aren't exactly identical, there are striking similarities and patterns, and the central meaning remains the same. We still haven't learned the importance of understanding the limits of human technology and the need to safeguard against the hubris of thinking we're infallible. Because until we learn those lessons, we're doomed to repeat them. And until we make the unconscious conscious, it will drive all our behavior, and we will call it fate. But all of this raises another question. If history is a fractal that repeats itself in similar ways throughout time, isn't it also conceivable that we might be able to glimpse and understand those patterns? When you begin to understand that synchronicities are the merging of the fractals of your inner world with the fractals of the outer world, you no longer see yourself as isolated or disconnected from the universe. Life becomes an experience you actively co-create with it. There's a powerful example of this in Amy Tan's book, The Opposite of Fate, where she shares a profound experience she had while trying to finish writing one of her stories. One day, for no apparent reason, a vision came into her mind. She saw herself in a dark valley filled with hundreds of rocks stacked at angles 
that defied the laws of gravity. It was a powerful image that seemed important to the story she was writing, but she couldn't explain why it needed to be in her novel. What did it mean, she wondered. Why should my character come to find these rocks? She kept writing and rewriting the scene, but she couldn't make it fit into the story. Then she went for a walk with her dogs and found herself at a beach, on a new path she'd never been to before. For reasons she can't explain, she decided to walk towards a particular pier. Underneath it, she saw a man stacking dozens of rocks at impossible angles, just like the vision she saw in her mind. How is it that these rocks don't fall over? She asked the man. I don't know, I guess with everything there's a point of balance. You just have to find it. Amy knew instantly that this was the meaning of the scene, and this complete stranger had somehow explained exactly why it had to be in her story, in a way that captured exactly what she was feeling in that moment, and in a way that completely resolved the problem she was stuck on. As it turns out, Amy's vision was just one of many synchronicities she was having that were oddly exact. At first they happened once a day, and then several times a day, it became impossible to ignore. It was as if in writing fiction I had opened my mind to the realm of all possibilities. Now the collective unconscious had yielded connections, images, and meanings. I was aware that other writers like James Merrill and William Butler Yeats also believed their writings were influenced by sources that were ethereal, mystical, and spiritual. But when she reflected on what happened, she couldn't help but wonder how the made-up stories turned out to be true how the ironies and coincidences accumulated, played off each other, forcing her to consider that everything that happens just might be a crazy quilt of love, pieced together, torn apart, repaired again and again, and strong enough to protect us all. To me, that sounds like a very poetic description of fractals and synchronicity. And much like Morgan Robertson, who may have tapped into a greater universal mind, the collective unconscious that gave him a glimpse of the story of a sinking ship when he thought he was writing a work of fiction that turned out to be real. Just maybe, he was accessing precisely the same source that Amy Tan did when she saw the vision of a valley filled with hundreds of rocks, only to encounter the exact same scene in her real waking life. The same source that countless other minds have also tapped into. For me, it hints at the possibility that synchronicity can show you flashes of a future that you can choose to make real. With each choice you make, as you enact the story of your life, you create ripples, fractals that move out into the world through space and time, affecting it in countless ways. It's what holds the key to uncovering meaning, connecting with your purpose, and aligning with the highest version of who you are. I'm convinced that all of it is related to another very powerful concept in practice that's been so important in my own life, manifestation. It's the art of focusing on your deepest desire and attracting it through your thoughts, words, and actions. It's captured in one of the simplest and most powerful ideas I know. We'll look at how you can manifest your heart's desire in this video that's now appearing on the left side of your screen. And you can click on it right now to watch it right away. As always, thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you in the next one.